So we know about dividers or divisors of a number. Uh, sometimes we, other one we call it is the factors. We can take a number and find its factors. Greatest common divisor, new concept we introduced and we'll see used uh, a bit more, relatively prime, two numbers. So given two numbers, I ask you, is, is seven, are seven and twelve relatively prime? Well, uh, so a pair of numbers, seven and twelve, if the greatest common divisor of those two numbers is one, then we say they, those two numbers are relatively prime. We'll use that concept as we go through. We know about prime numbers. Uh, I think you know about prime numbers. And note that any integer can be factored into primes. That is, can be made up as multiplying primes together. So, given some integer, often we can try and find the prime factors. That is, given an integer, find the primes that when we multiply them together we get that integer. So find the prime factors of a number and that will become important as we go through. Some primes and then we started to introduce not normal arithmetic but modular arithmetic everything mod n where the answers are always within our set of 0 up to n minus 1 when we mod n called the set Zn. And we went through addition, and addition in modular arithmetic conceptually is easy. It's just the same as normal addition, but you mod the answer by n. Uh, we didn't come to that. Then we can talk about an additive inverse of a number. Add two numbers together, and if you get zero in mod n, then we say one is the additive inverse of the other. 3 plus 7 mod 10 equals 0, therefore 7 is the additive inverse of 3 and 3 is the additive inverse of 7. And subtraction simply becomes addition by adding the additive inverse of the number we're trying to subtract. We'll come back to some examples in a moment, just summarize the concepts. Multiplication in modular arithmetic is easy, conceptually we just multiply the numbers and mod by n. And we also have the concept of a multiplicative inverse. If you multiply two numbers together and you get one, and then we, so that we say that those two numbers are the multiplicative inverse of each other. A times B, if it's equal to one in mod n, then B is a multiplicative inverse of A and vice versa. Every number has an additive inverse. We can always find some number and add another number such that we'll get zero in mod n. So every number has an additive inverse, but not every number has a multiplicative inverse. There are some numbers in our set that we cannot multiply by any other number and mod by n and get one as the answer. So some numbers don't have a multiplicative inverse, and it turns out that some number a will have a multiplicative inverse in mod n if a is relatively prime to n. So if the modulus is n, some integer a, if a and n are relatively, relatively prime, meaning the greatest common divisor of a and n is 1, then a will have a multiplicative inverse, and we can find that value. Otherwise it will not. And then we'll see that division is simply multiplication of the multiplicative inverse. Subtraction is the addition of the additive inverse. Division is the multiplication of the multiplicative inverse. And then we'll move on to a few more concepts. So just continue with the examples to demonstrate all these, uh, just to make sure everyone's clear. Let's go through what? Maybe some different ones from, from yesterday. In in mod 8, as an example, everything mod 8. 
So I will not write the mod 8, in, just to be brief. Uh, what numbers have a multiplicative inverse in mod 8? So the numbers... Let's list them. When we multiply, what's the multiplicative inverse of 1 in mod 8? We multiply 1 by some number if the answer is 1 when we mod by 8, then that is its inverse. So we'd say if that's the integer a, then the multiplicative inverse of a for 1 is 1. 1 times 1 mod 8 is 1. What's the multiplicative inverse of 2? 2 times some number, mod 8 equals 1. There is no such number. Why? Well, how do we know? How can we check? 2 and 8 are not relatively prime. The greatest common divisor of 2 and 8 is 2. If it, it needs to be 1 for it to be relatively prime and it needs to be 1 for them to have a multiplicative inverse. So there is no inverse of 2. So I'll just note just as a cross. 3, does 3 have a multiplicative inverse? Are 3 and 8 relatively prime? Greatest common divisor of 3 and 8 is 1. Yes, they are relatively prime. Therefore, yes, 3 does have a multiplicative, multiplicative inverse. Because the greatest common divisor of 3 and 8 is 1. The divisors of 3 are 1 and 3, of 8, 1, 2, 4, 8. Greatest common value is 1. Therefore, we can say that 3 and 8 are relatively prime. 3 and 8 are, are just not relatively prime. Not prime, relatively prime. And that means that 3 does have a multiplicative inverse. What is its value? 3 times something equals 1. 3 times 3 equals 1. In mod 8, 3 times 3 mod 8 is 1. So the multiplicative inverse of 3 is 3. And then do so for the remaining numbers, 4, 5, 6, 7. Find their multiplicative inverse. Or if they don't have one, note that. So check... Does the integer have an inverse? If so, find the value. Are 4 and 8 relatively prime? 4 and 8 have a greatest common divisor of 4. Therefore, 4 and 8 are not relatively prime, and therefore 4 does not have an inverse in mod 8. So there's no inverse of 4. Are 5 and 8 relatively, relatively prime? Yes, because the greatest common divisor of 5 and 8 is 1. Divisors are 5, 5 is a prime number, uh, and 8 is not a multiple of 5. So yes, it does have a multiplicative inverse. What is its value? 5 times something equals 1, mod 8. Turns out it's actually itself. 5 times 5 is 25, mod 8 is 1, because 3 times 8 is 24. 6, no inverse. 7, is... 7 relatively prime with 8? Yes. Greatest common divisor of 7 and 8 is 1. So what is the inverse of 7? 
Yes, it's in fact 7. 7 times 7 is 49. Mod 8 is 1. 6 times 8 is 48. So in this case, when we have mod 8, the numbers 1, 3, 5 and 7 have an inverse. And in this case, but not all cases, just in this example, they are actually uh, inverses of themselves. We'll see some other examples later that they, they don't have to be the inverse of themselves. So it doesn't have to be 3 and 3, just in mod 8 it is. So if we know the inverse, we can do division. All in mod 8. What is 2 divided by 3? And remember, when we're using modular arithmetic, the answers, is all, answers are always in the set 0 up to n minus 1. So what's 2 divided by 3? 6. Check. Yes, correct. Everyone see if they can work out why it's 6. 2 divided by 3 is 6. Division. In our normal arithmetic, what is division? When we have uh, 2 divided by 3, it's the same as 2 times 1 over 3. 2 times the inverse of 3 in normal arithmetic. The same concept here. Division is multiplication of the multiplicative inverse. Equals 2 times, denote it mi, the multiplicative inverse of 3. And we just work that out. In mod 8, the multiplicative inverse of 3 is in fact 3. Hence it's 6. Still in mod 8. 2 divided by 4. Two divided by four is there is no answer. Again, for division, we multiply by the multiplicative inverse. So multiply by the multiplicative inverse of 4, but there is no such value. We just worked out before that we cannot multiply 4 by a number and get 1. 4 does not have an inverse. So we cannot divide by 4 in mod 8. So we cannot do that. I'll just write across. We can't solve them solve that. So with modular arithmetic we can only divide by numbers that have an inverse which are the numbers which are relatively prime with the modulus. So we've gone through the four basic operations in arithmetic. We'll see two more in a moment. To extensions. Similar, uh, if we go back a, one slide, similar in normal arithmetic, there's a, a number of properties or rules that apply that can simplify uh, calculations. So a number of laws. So And they are listed here. You don't have to remember them. Um, but they're effectively the same as in normal arithmetic. Uh, W plus X mod N is the same as X plus W mod N. W plus X plus Y is the same as W plus 
x plus y all mod n. Okay, so this is normal arith arithmetic laws. W times x plus y mod n is the same as W times x plus W times y mod n. So this is uh, nothing new compared to our normal arithmetic. And th these ones at the top that I've listed are useful as well. And we'll see that they become very useful in some of the operations we perform in cryptography, or at least the ones we will see. Uh, effectively, we can expand or contract. So it depends on which way we look at it. A mod n plus B mod n all by all mod n. So the answer of this mod n is the same as simply A plus B mod n. Similar with subtraction and multiplication. And we often use that if, for example, we have multiplication A times B mod n we can break it out into smaller values to mod by n. Let's see that. What is 160 mod 8? Without a calculator? Well, you can go through and, and work out. Let's do it the long way and solve it uh, in the long approach. We can use these properties that this one, A times B mod N is the same as A mod N times B mod N all mod N. So we have 160 mod 8. Let's find two factors of 160, A and B, and then mod those values to simplify the numbers we're dealing with. What are two factors of 160? There are multiple factors, but two numbers multiplied together to get 160. Easy ones. 10, yours is not easy. 10 and 16, okay. Ten times 16, 160, which is, and I'll just move over here, is the same as, using our laws, 10 mod 8, <coughs> times, 16 mod 8 all mod 8 looks complex but in fact what do we end up with 10 mod 8 easy the remainder is 2 times 16 mod 8 what do we get? Zero. Mod eight. Is zero. Two times zero. Zero mod eight. So, there's, although there's no need to do it in this case, you can solve directly the idea is that once we have big numbers, not 160 but a very large number, mod some modulus, then to solve it we can break that large number into its factors and solve the modulus of those factors faster.
And in fact, we can have computer algorithms that will do that for us. If we, can, if we know the factors of the number, we can find the modulus of the factor, multiply them together, and mod by 8 at the end, or mod by n. We'll see that come in play in a moment, once we look at exponentials. So, four operations so far. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Next, we've got two more operators. Let's go to them. We'll come back to these theorems after these operators. The next two operators. Exponentiation and logarithms, which are really just extensions of multiplication and division. Exponentiation is just multiplying multiple times. So a to the power of b is just a times b uh, where we have b instances of a, a times a times a, b times. And logarithms, the inverse of exponentiation. So first, exponentiation is quite easy. It's the, similar, the same concept as we use in normal arithmetic. Then we just use our normal arithmetic. 2 to the power of 3 is 8. Mod 7 is 1. Easy. So exponentiation is easy. Solve this one. No calculators. 11 to the power of 7. Mod 13. Bonus, one mark for the quiz, if someone can do it quickly. No calculators. Twelve. Come and show me. You're ready to show me? How do you solve it? Eleven to the power of seven mod thirteen. Nine maybe? I, I really want to know the process that to, to solve it. Alright, first first approach is uh, the the normal approach. Okay, eleven times eleven is hundred and twenty one. Times eleven again we get whatever it is. My brain's not uh, turned on today, it won't calculate that, so times 11 seven times you'll get some big number okay do that in your head not so easy all right with a calculator easy let's do it in our head so one way is to use the property that we just saw is that remember exponentiation is just multiplication multiple times let's break this into there's different ways to do it uh, Let's break this into we'll see why in a minute, but eleven to the power of the seven is the same as eleven to the power of four times eleven eleven to the power of two times eleven. Okay. That is the exponents four plus two plus one here. I'll even write it. 7. That's a normal property of, log of exponentiation. How does it help us? Well, using... Just going back, we're going to try and use this property here, to the one that we used in the example before, that multiplying two numbers together, mod n, we can expand that to be 
A mod n times B mod n all mod n. Now we have three numbers multiplied together. We can expand them using this, this property or rule. So it becomes, actually let's, what's 11 to the power of 4? So why did I do this? My brain can only, I can think of 11 to the power of 1 is 11, 11 to the power of 2 is 121, 11 to the power of 3 I don't know, okay? Alright, I could calculate it, but I don't know it off the top of my head. So let's try and deal it and keep the numbers small to values that I can use in my head. So let's try and break this into numbers lower than uh, 11 to the power of 2. 11 to the power of 4, I don't know what it is. 11 to the power of 2, I know, is 121. But 11 to the power of 4 is, in fact, 11 squared squared. Again, that's nothing new. That's just a property of exponentiation. 11 squared, I know. It's 121. All mod 13. Nothing special yet. Then we use our property that A, we had a property A times B mod 13 is the same as A mod 13 times B mod 13 all mod 13. And we can extend that when we have effectively A times B times C mod 13. So we get um, 121 squared mod 13 121 mod 13 times 11 mod 13. All mod 13. And now I can start to solve some in my head at least. What's 11 mod 13? Well, that one's 11. What's 121 mod 13? Anyone solve it in the head? Four? Okay, two people said it. Let's trust them. Hundred and thirty times ten thirteen times ten is hundred and thirty minus nine is eleven, so thirteen minus nine is four. And hundred and twenty one squared mod thirteen? Four squared mod thirteen. Okay. Hundred and twenty one mod thirteen is four. So hundred and twenty one squared mod thirteen would be if we apply the same logic here of expanding would be four squared mod thirteen. So we've solved hundred and twenty one mod thirteen. This becomes four squared mod thirteen. Because 121 mod 13 is 4. All mod 13. And 4 squared mod 13 is 3. Again, how do we do that step? Okay, from this step, we've got think A times B times C mod 13, our rules say that we can split that up to be A mod 13 times B mod 13 times C mod 13, all mod 13. Then, okay, 11 mod 13, 11, 121 mod 13, we use our brain, 4, 
121 squared mod 13, in fact, we've applied this same rule again. 121 squared mod 13, 121 mod 13 times 121 mod 13, all mod 13, is 4 squared mod 13. And what do we get? 3 times 4 times 11. Seventy-seven. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah, not add. Well done. Twelve times eleven, hundred and thirty-two mod thirteen. <coughs> Which is an easy one. Two. All right, so we've started with what? 11 to the power of 7 mod 13, and we can manually go through the steps and use this, especially this property of expanding, and get the answer of 2. Of course, we don't have to do this all the time. We have calculators to do this, but even with a calculator, when you have large numbers, not 11 to the power of 7, but... Uh, a 10-digit number to the power of a 5-digit number, some numbers that don't uh, are not handled on your calculator, or even a very, very large number which take a long time to calculate uh, on a computer, we can have an algorithm that would do this type of steps for us. It speeds up the computation. So software can be used to implement these steps to speed up the compu computation when we're doing exponentiation in modular arithmetic. You can check. Uh, I calculated before 11 to the power of 70, 7. Yes, so there in general with exponentiation we can apply these rules and uh, be faster than calculating direct the exponentiation that's the point that is calculating 11 to the power of 7 first and getting this and then mod by 13 when we have large numbers it's faster to uh, instead of calculating 11 to the power of 7 first, then break it into smaller numbers and mod by a number, our modulus. My calculator will do it direct. I hope. Okay, so it's easy with small numbers. With large numbers, using these rules can speed up the, the calculation. Large numbers, we're, we'll see we're starting to deal with hundreds of digits. Not 10 digits, not uh, 20 numbers digits long, but hundreds of digits in length. Okay, what's next? That's exponentiation, raising a, na a num number to, a, uh, to the exponent or to a power rather simple in modular arithmetic, but we've got rules to speed up the calculation. We'll return a little bit later to logarithms. Logarithms are just the inverse of ex exponentiation, but it gets a bit more complex. Before we go through logarithms, there are some theorems that people have developed that combine some of these concepts together so it, that apply when we use modular arithmetic and in fact we'll use these later when we do encryption so we're going to use a lot of this theory later in the next topic Fermat's theorem actually can be written in two ways and we're not going to try and prove the theorems we're just going to accept that they're true someone's done that and, and come up with them uh, but we'll use them when necessary. Fermat's theorem, the first form, so it's the same theorem but just written in two different forms. If P is prime, if we have prime number P and some positive integer 
A which is not divisible by that prime P, then it holds that A to the power of P minus 1 is equivalent to 1 when we mod by P. Okay, so that's Fermat's theorem. It can be modified or written in a different form, depending on what you want to do with it, to this second form here. If P is prime and A is any positive integer, then it holds that A to the power of P is equivalent to A in mod P. So we can use that if we have some statement a to the power of p a to the power of p mod p assuming p is prime then we immediately know the answer is a that's what fermat's theorem tells us and all right let's accept that but just show a quick example to demonstrate that it does indeed hold uh, What is 3 to the power of 5 in mod 5? What is 3 to the power of 5 in mod 5? Too slow. The answer, if you use Fermat's theorem, you should see is 3. So let's check. So we don't need to manually calculate 3 to the power of 5. We could, and we will in a moment, but note Fermat's theorem says that if P is prime, the exponent is prime and the, it's the same as the modulus, then take any positive integer, A, raised to P, mod P is A. So in our example, we have 3 to the power of 5, A is 3, P is 5, 5 is a prime number, so, in our case, the general form is that's assuming P is prime. Well, we have P equal to 5. It's a prime number. A is 3. So it fits the form of Fermat's theorem, which means a to the power of P is the same as A when we mod by P. 3 to the power of 5 when we mod by 5 is the same as 3. Note that we just, this is different ways to write the, the modulus. This writing in brackets here effectively means both sides are mod by P. We're using mod P as the arithmetic. So A to the power of P mod P equals A. That's what Fermat's theorem tells us, if P is prime. And that's true in our case. So we can use that again as a shortcut to find the solution when we've gotten integers raised to a prime power and mod by that prime. Okay, uh, that's just a simple demonstration of Fermat's theorem. You can check with other prime numbers and see that it does hold. Well, does it hold? What is 3 to the power of 5? 3 to the power of 5. 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27, times 3 is 81, times 3 is 243. 3 to the power of 5 equals 243. 243, 243, mod 5 equals 3. Mod 5, 240, mod 5 is 0, so we have a remainder of 3. It's 
so it's true in this case. And if you try all values that fit that p is prime, then you'll find that that's true. We often use, we'll see that we'll use the second form of this theorem uh, in cryptography. And we'll see now another theorem, Euler's theorem, but before that we need to introduce Euler's totient function. Phi of n is the notation. The totient function of some number n returns the count or the number of positive integers that are less than n and relatively prime with n. Or this totient function. So the totient of n, we look at the integers from 1 up to n minus 1. We determine which ones of them are rel relatively prime with n and count those ones. Count the number that are relatively prime and that's the answer, the count of them. We'll see some uh, properties of that, of that in a moment. Some examples of that. What is Euler's totient of 8? Well, let's go the, the full way to determine it. We look at the numbers from 1 up until 7, check if they're relatively prime to 8, and then count how many are. So let's list them. <coughs> Is 1 relatively prime with 8? Yes, 1 and 8, greatest common divisor is 1. So yes. 2 and 8, relatively prime? No. 3 and 8? Yes. 4 and 8 are not because they have a divisor of 4. 5 and 8? Yes. 6 and 8 are not because they have a divisor of 2. And 7 and 8? Yes. So the answer is 4. So the totient, Euler's totient of 8 is 4. It's the number of numbers less than 8 which are relatively prime with 8. The count of numbers. What's quickly determined the totient of 9? Euler's totient of 9. Maybe. Sounds good. Try and find yourself the totient of 9. So the long way to solve is to find the numbers from 1 up until 8. 9 minus 1, check whether they're rel relatively prime with 9, and then count how many are. One up until 8, are they relatively prime with 9? One is relatively prime with every number because the greatest common divisor of one and that number is always one. So yes. Two and nine, relatively prime, yes or no? Hands up for no. All right, good, well done. Three and nine have a divisor greater than one, so no. Four and nine, 
greatest common divisor of 1. 5 and 9, greatest common divisor of 1. 6 and 9, greatest common divisor of 3. 7 and 9, 1. 8 and 9. We have 6 numbers less than 9, which are relatively prime with 9, so the totient of 9 is 6. Easy. Keep going. Totient of 23. Well, I don't want you to go and try all numbers 1 up to 22. Of course you can. It won't take long. But we'll start to identify some, some patterns. In this case, let's come back to 23. Let's do an easier one. What's the totient of 5? do that one. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1 and 5, relatively prime. 2 and 5, relatively prime. 3 and 5, greatest common divisor of 1, so is 4 and 5. It's 4. What's the shortcut? 5 is a prime number. By definition, all numbers less than 5 will be relatively prime with 5. Because 5 being a prime number, its factors are 1 and 5. So any number less than 5 has a greatest common divisor with 5 of 1 only. So the Euler's totient of a prime number is that prime number minus 1. There are 4 numbers less than 5 relatively prime with 5. So if you can identify the number as a prime number, you immediately know that the answer 23 is a prime number, the totient will be 22. Okay, so there's the first shortcut that's useful. The totient of a prime number is that number minus 1. The totient of 1 is 1. For prime p, the totient of p is p minus 1. And you can see a small extension of that, and it will become useful later. For primes p and q, where n equals p times q, the totient of n, e, so n equals p times q, the totient of n equals the totient of p times q equals the totient of p times the totient of q equals p minus 1 times q minus 1. So that's the case where p and q are prime numbers multiplied together. There are others, but this last one we'll make uh, heavy use of later when we see in cryptography. What's the totient of 77? Again. 16. No. 6, 0. Why? Okay, go and write the numbers 1 up to 76. Check which are relatively prime with 77. Yeah, you'll find the answer, but too slow. What do we know? 77, its factors, or its prime factors, that is, the primes that we multiply together to get 77 are 7 and 11. And 
our property is that it turns out that it equals the totient of 7 times the totient of 11. And 7 and, uh, and 11 are prime numbers. So totient of a prime number is that number minus 1. Totient of 7 is 6. The totient of 11 is 10. So the answer is 60. So that's using the, uh, this property that the totient of a prime is p minus 1 and also the multiplication of those two primes uh, we can expand to get p minus 1 times q minus 1. Now that step required me to factor 77 into two primes. So that was the first jump I had to make to see, oh, 77 is actually 7 times 11. And seven, time, 7 and 11 are both prime numbers. So factoring into the primes was needed there. If we can do that, we can quickly solve the totient. If we can't do that, then it takes longer to solve the totient if we go through the manual steps of 1 up to 76. And it also applies as we go to longer numbers. That's Euler's totient function. And related to that, Euler's theorem, again written in two forms. Let's just focus on the second form because we'll see that in, in being used when we look at cryptography. For positive integers a and n, a to the power of the totient of n plus 1 mod n equals a. So Euler's theorem tells us that. So if we can set uh, some, some value in this form, then we can quickly find the, the totient, uh, the mod modulus, or the mod n. Let's see an example. What's the answer? Try and solve this one. Four thousand three hundred and sixty two to the power of sixty one all mod seventy seven. No calculator allowed. A common quiz or exam question, maybe a quiz question. Well, no calculator allowed cannot solve it by hand. Okay, so the idea is to think, okay, do one of our theorems help in this case? So, so far we've introduced two theorems, Fermat's theorem and Euler's theorem. Does this statement or question match the format of one of those theorems? And Euler's theorem here says for two integers, a and n, if a to the power of the totient of n plus 1 mod n equals a. Well, let's check. Does it match that format? So we'll write that. So Euler's theorem tells us that if we have a to the totient of n plus 1 mod n equals a. Well, we just solved. What is the totient? Does this fit this form? Well, if n is 77, 
we found before the torsion of n, just above, was 60. So the torsion of n plus 1 is 61. So in fact it does match this form. Some number to the power of the totion of 77 plus 1, that is 61, mod 77, the answer is that original number. Four three six two to the power of sixty one is four three six two to the power of the totion of seventy seven <coughs> plus one mod seventy seven running out of space. Because the totion of seventy seven we calculated to be sixty, so this matches Euler's theorem's form. And which tells us the answer to that is A, or 4362 in our case. So we can only use this theorem if we have a statement or a question that matches the, the correct form, or if we can rearrange it rearrange it to sit, suit that form. And in fact, we'll, again, we'll see when we look at this return to cryptography that we'll see some of our encryption algorithms take advantage of this fact. The point is that 4362 to the power of 61 is a large number. And then mod 77 takes some time to solve. But we've solved it immediately. Since it's in the form of this theorem, we've immediately got the answer of 4362. Now do it with a large number, that is tens of digits, hundreds of digits, or well, actually tens of digits here, raised to the power of a hundreds of digits number here, and too large to calculate manually, but using this theorem, if it matches the form, we can immediately get the answer. So it's a way to speed up the calculation, make it practical. Let's look at logarithms. I know a couple of minutes left. Uh, we'll introduce logarithms. And uh, remember, logarithms are the opposite operation of exponential in normal arithmetic. And same in log in modular arithmetic. So in our normal arithmetic. As an example, 2 to the power of 6 is 64. So the log in base 2 of 64 equals 6. Okay, that's our normal arithmetic. We use the same concept in modular arithmetic. give you an example and then we'll calculate it later. I've calculated this one before. 2 to the power of 13 mod 19. We can do it in the calculator. 2 to the power of 13 mod 19. 2 to the 13, sorry, mod 19 is 3. Okay, calculator there. Then the inverse operation is the logarithm, but now we have the modulus. We call it a discrete logarithm in modular arithmetic, often written as d log. The discrete logarithm, the base is 2. There's a subscript here, 2. But we have another subscript, which is the modulus. We write it as the discrete logarithm in base 2 
with mod 19 of 3 equals 13. So using the same concept of our normal arithmetic, the logarithm is the inverse operation to exponentiation. It's the same in modular arithmetic, but we call it a discrete log. The discrete log in base 2 with modulus 19 of 3 equals the exponent 13. That's the way to read that. And in the same way that exponentiation is just multiplying multiple times, discrete logarithm we can think of as we're using division. So it's related. In the same way that division relies on a multiplicative inverse, and not all numbers have a multiplicative inverse, it follows that not all numbers can we find the discrete log of. So we cannot always divide by, uh, we cannot divide by any number in modular arithmetic. Some numbers we cannot find the discrete logarithm of. So it doesn't all, it's not always solvable. Same as division is not always solvable in modular arithmetic. Next week we'll look at some cases where it's not solvable and the conditions when it becomes solvable. And that will finish this topic on number theory and then we'll move on to public key cryptography and we'll look at an algorithm that uses a lot of these concept, concepts. Uh, exponentiation, um, the different theorems that we introduce, Euler's totient, and eventually an algorithm that uses the discrete logarithm to encrypt data. So it all start to make sense when we see it in a practical uh, cryptography example. For now, we'll stop our lecture. You'll have a homework task. I'll release it either today or tomorrow on the website. It will involve using some software. Okay, so I'll give you some instructions. And it will be quite easy once you learn how to use it. I'll give you detailed instructions. You, basically, you will need to decrypt some ciphertext that I give you using this software. The software runs on Linux or Unix, so if you have a, a, a Mac or a computer or you have access to a Linux computer, you can use this software. It doesn't run natively on Windows. Uh, alternatives you have, and I'll give some details in the instructions, but some alternatives will be to use uh, the ICT server, which you have accounts on, or the, the lab computers, the Mac computers on the third floor uh, all have this software available. So you'll see an email with some instructions for the homework. You'll have a week or a bit longer than a week to do it. Um, but just a warning, that will come out before the weekend. Okay.